afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. More than 60% of the milk consumed in New England comes from dairy cows in Vermont. Vermont milk is also made into dairy products that feed millions of people from Boston to Bangor. A byproduct of dairy farming is cow manure, which is a valuable resource for farmers. The winter ban on manure spreading ends April 1st, so you'll begin to see farmers fertilizing their fields. This afternoon, we're going to discuss how farmers make sure the manure stays in the soil for the health of their crops and the environment. We begin with a video created by dairy farmers and UVM Extension to explain the process. Cows make delicious dairy for all of us to enjoy. They also make a lot of something else. Whatever you call it, farmers don't call it waste. On a dairy farm, we're all about closing the cycles. We grow feed to feed our cows. When it comes out the back end of the cows, we call it manure, but it contains all the nutrients that we need to replenish our fields so that we can grow the crops to feed the cows the next year. Farmers know the nutrients need to stay in the soil and out of the waterways in order to produce healthy foods, healthy crops, and a healthy environment. That's why they use a special formula to feed each field the nutrients it needs. We balance how much nutrients are in the manure, how much nutrients are already in the soil, what the crop needs to grow, and to figure out exactly how much manure each field needs. Another way some farmers nourish the soil and keep the water near their fields clean is with a practice called manure injection, which buries the manure up to 12 inches in the ground. Farmers pipe the manure from the farm to a tractor in the field, which injects the nutrient-rich manure under the ground. The benefits are big. Fuel emissions are reduced with fewer trucks on the road. You can't smell the manure because the odor is trapped in the ground. And because the manure stays in the ground, nutrients like phosphorus stay in the soil and don't enter the water. A win-win for our waterways and the crops that farmers grow. So if you can get that manure under the surface, then you're gonna have far less likelihood of it running off, say if you have a rainstorm. If you have healthy, high-functioning soil, you have healthy crops growing, but you also then are protecting the environment, reducing runoff, all of that kind of comes together around soil health. I have never been prouder to be part of uh, the agricultural community than I am right now. We have three generations of our family farming here. My grandchildren are here, and I want our great-grandchildren to be able to stay here as well. And that's part of why we try to do the best job we possibly can. Well, that video was produced by three farmer-led watershed protection groups, the Champlain Valley Farmer Coalition, the Connecticut River Watershed Farmers Alliance, and the Franklin and Grand Isle Farmers Watershed Alliance. Joining me now are two guests. Kirsten Workman is an agronomy specialist with UVM Extension and the secretary of the Champlain Valley Watershed Alliance. And Larry Jarvis is a dairy farmer in Bakersfield. Larry is the vice chair of the Franklin and Grand Isle Farmers Watershed Alliance. Thank you both for coming in. Thanks for having us. Now, Kirsten, some people might think that Manure is only a waste product, but it is actually an important resource. It's very valuable to farmers, and I'm sure Larry would echo that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it's very important to a dairy farm in terms of growing forage crops for their cows. So it's it's a very valuable fertilizer, and any gardener would tell you that they'd be very happy to have that kind of nutrient source to add to their garden to grow their crops. And dairy farmers are really good at recycling everything mm -hmm. <laughs> and utilizing everything. And um, manure is definitely a huge part of that. Because so. there's plenty of manure since I think my notes tell me a cow yes. produces as much as how much manure a day? Well, in pounds it sounds a lot because it's heavy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like 120 pounds and it's of manure and urine all together. Um, so that's, you know, just about 14 gallons in volume a day. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, that, that, that material is also used for many other things on the farm. So some farms are using it through their anaerobic digesters to create electricity. Others are separating the manure and using the solids for bedding and reusing it in the barn. Um, and then still using what's left for fertilizing their crops. 
Um, so it's a very, very valuable resource. So how do farmers uh, make sure that they're applying the right amount of manure to their fields that right. will be absorbed in the soil? That's a really good question. Um, so the first thing, you talked about the winter manure spreading ban. And mm -hmm. so in Vermont, that's one way that we do it is by when we spread. So we're not spreading, hopefully, when um, there's going to be the most risk of loss. So we do that during the growing season. Mm -hmm. um, and then most farms now in the state of Vermont are going to be required to have a nutrient management plan. Um, and so many, like Larry, already have one, um, and many more will soon have those as well. And that sort of is a prescription of how much manure on each individual field based on soil tests, what crop you're growing, and what nutrients are in the manure itself. Once again, so things don't get wasted. Exactly. And then now, you know, with buffers, that's going to be another really important piece is um, making sure that we're not spreading too close to our waterways. Mm -hmm. So 25 feet from streams and rivers and ponds and 10 feet from our ditches. So that keeps it in the field. And then, of course, many farms like, like Larry are, are actually injecting it under the surface, but I'll let him talk about that. <laughs> yeah, Larry, why is it important to you to make sure that you properly manage the manure from your farm? Uh, First and foremost, uh, we live on the land that we farm, and myself, coming from a large family, there's 15 children and over 40 grandchildren. Uh, that is a big family. <laughs> definitely. We want to keep something intact for them to uh, be able to keep farming from there. And uh, utilizing the manure, uh, it's, it's kind of like a, me, myself being a dairy farmer, we're always trying to uh, do better things for the cow, her environment. Uh, making things better for her to produce a great quality. Well, this, the soil that you have produces the feed for that cow, so you need to be able to take care of that also, similar to the cow. Mm -hmm. So we need to look better at what we're actually doing in, to the soil and, in, in, you know, in the microbiology of the soil uh, underneath the layers, top layers. Well, tell me about some of the new technology that you're using to get the best use out of your manure. Uh, so we put a digester on uh, one of our dairies in 2008, and uh, we are able to take the gas, the methane gas from there, and produce electricity for our farm in several far uh, homes nearby. And, uh, you know, that cuts the cost for uh, running our dairy. And uh, another byproduct we get, we squeeze uh, the effluent that comes out and get us some solids, use that for bedding mm -hmm. for it's the like cows. sawdust, really. Sawdust. Mm -hmm. and, and going through the <clears throat> digestive process, it uh, doesn't have bacteria, so it's, it's a really great environment for the cows to lay on. And, uh, but one of the uh, things that happens by doing that, the effluent or the manure product that you have now is more watery. So when you apply it on land, it tends to, to roll all over the place more. And uh, so we'd like to, we went through some different systems to try to figure out how to take better care and keep it where it needs to be. And we first started with a manure spreader with some injectors in the back. But we also want to take uh, the compaction away from the soils. And we started looking at the dry going systems where it's just a, a tractor and a line that's dragging it across the field. And, and we're able to inject it just below the surface, right where, the, where it needs to be. And, and we've gone through a couple different till, tillage toolbars where now, last year, we actually, we, uh, the Severies from Madison County have a drag line system, and, and they had these Dietrich shanks that go on the, these uh, tillage equipment, and it doesn't disturb the soil too much, places the manure in there. And I was able to go with my corn planter afterwards and not doing any more tillage be able to, to plant my crops into that. Wow. Well, another priority um, that the two of you share is to help more farmers and the public understand the benefits of cover cropping. You're both part of the next video that shows how farmers are using cover crops to improve the health of soil and water. Healthy soil means we have healthy foods to eat, but healthy soil needs to be protected. This rainfall simulator will show how the water is going to move through the ground and how the water is going to move over the ground. So the buckets in front here are going to catch runoff that's funneled across the field and down through this chute and down into this bucket. When a farm field is left bare, the topsoil can get blown away by the wind or washed away by the rain, and the nutrients in the soil can enter our water. That's why farmers are finding innovative ways to keep their soils in place for the health of our land, water, and food supply. Traditionally, what we would do is, after the corn was harvested, we'd plow that field back up and we'd let it sit there all winter long. As we understand the soil movement more, um, we are changing practices. And we're applying science. 
farmers are thinking about their soils and they're thinking about them in a very different way than they did before. The adoption of cover crops in Vermont has been extremely rapid over the last couple of years. Cover crops are plants that are like a protective blanket for the soil during the winter. That means that a farmer's field is covered with plants year round. In the spring, farmers plant their regular crops, like corn, that grow through the summer and are harvested in the fall. At the same time, in the fall, farmers plant a protective cover crop, like the cereal grain winter rye, that will grow through the winter. Keeping the soil in place during the snow melts and then hopefully during the rains of the spring. That's helping, you know, enrich the organic matter of the soil and keeping the soil in place. The field we're in today, the farmer planted the winter rye, and then the spring, it, it survives the winter, it grows. They actually harvested that cover crop as a forage crop to feed their cows, and then came in right after and planted without tilling anything and just planted their corn. And that's what we see, you know, growing here today. So we went from having a crop growing from, you know, May to October to now having a crop growing every month of the year. And so the, that plant, that living organism, is doing all sorts of work. These cover crops, the root systems that they provide in the soil, are actually doing the tillage work themselves and the worms will travel up and down these root systems and it allows the water to infiltrate down into the soils instead of running off the, the tops. The healthy soil is full of living organic matter that holds water, a lot of water. Each 1% increase in soil organic matter through using cover crops helps soil hold 25,000 gallons more water per acre. The more closely we got to natural conditions, the less runoff that occurred. If you look at the back buckets, the no-till and the hay field and the forest floor show the most amounts of soaking in occurring, and that helps trap the sediment that would come off the field. We are proud at the end of each day. We know that we are doing it in a manner that's good for our animals. We're doing it in a manner that's good for the soil, good for the environment, and good for our families. We're back in the studio now where I'm discussing farmer-led efforts to protect our water quality. Larry, what type of plants do you use for your cover crops? Uh, we have, uh, of course, we, the main one we use is winter rye. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to get some different ones in, which is rye grass, some clover, some vetch, uh, even tillage radishes, uh, uh, and being part of the Farmers Watershed Alliance, which is located in Franklin County in Grand Isle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we have been doing more cover cropping in over 10,000 acres this past year and, uh, and also learning how to, to put these cover crops into the ground earlier because a lot of them can be planted late in the season. They have to be planted before September or September 15th. So you have a growing corn crop, you have to try different methods to be able to establish this cover crop and use, using UVM extension in your research. Uh, I know up in Franklin County, Heather Darby has it in Kirsten as in Addison, different plots where they try different diverse uh, cover crops. Uh, and Kirsten, use. does it matter what crops you use? I mean, the most important thing is having something living and growing out there, so mm -hmm. just depending on your system. But yeah, I mean, definitely different plants are going to provide different ecosystem services, and that's what we're tra really trying to figure out. And farmers like Larry and the folks that I work with down in Addison and Chittenden and Rutland County um, are helping us figure that out to see what are the benefits and what does better here in Vermont. So, so overall, are more farmers using cover crops? Vastly. Really? So, Good. yeah. I mean, the last three to five years, it's been a huge increase. And I think people just driving around probably even notice it. I mean, we've gone to you know, a handful of fields that were getting cover cropped five years ago to now this year. Um, we worked with NRCS to try and get a bigger picture of the whole statewide impact. And, and we're, we're estimating over 25, almost 26,000 acres of cover crop in Vermont this year. Yeah. And that's roughly a quarter or more of our cropland that's in annual crops. So that's, that's really impactful um, to see that happen so quickly. And, and that, what's really important about that is that translates into huge savings in erosion. So those 26,000 acres are saving at least, you know, 28 tons of topsoil staying in the field. And that equates to something around, we estimate, 50 tons of phosphorus that's not leaving those farm fields. So that's really important. That is important, too. And I, I would think your neighbors watching what you're doing saying, well, you know, how come you're planting this time of year? Yeah. But it's, it works. It, yeah, it definitely works. And, you know, like you said, the public's watching us. And 
and you're just trying to do the best job for yourself, but it's also for the surrounding people environment around you. Yeah, definitely. All right, well, folks want to learn more about what we're talking about, you can check out the Must Be the Milk website that's listed on your screen. You can also explore Must Be the Milk on Facebook and see and learn the various ways that farmers are working to protect our water and soil. Thanks so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Judy. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. Thank you.